Our next speaker, Dr. Joseph Anabali, is currently practicing as the chief psychiatrist at the Amans Clinic, Amans Clinic in Washington, D.C. He graduated magna cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and attended medical school at the Pennsylvania State University, where he conducted research on calcium channel med medications, presented his research na nationally, excuse me, and published several scientific papers on his work. While completing his residency in psychiatry, Dr. Anabali was named a Rox Leister Scholar in Psychiatry by the American Medical Association and a John Frederick Steinman Fellow. Please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Joseph Anabali. Hey, uh, whoa, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We have some people coming in uh, at the back there. Uh, happy to be here today. I am Chief Psychiatrist at Amon Clinics. Uh, it, it's actually in Reston, Virginia. We say the Washington, D.C. area, but we're in Reston. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Lyme disease and the brain. And let's see if we can make this work. Here we go. Um, this is a picture of me there. I like to play guitar, that's a guitar player, and my uh, good buddy Gary. And um, I got interested in Lyme, really interested about five years ago when my buddy Gary, who's a supremely healthy guy and hikes the mountains and, and does all kind of uh, incredible athletic stuff, uh, he became suddenly very ill and nearly died from Lyme disease. He had a cardiac conduction defect uh, in his heart. And uh, that drove home for me how serious Lyme can be. And then, let's see here. Um, this is one of our, my daughter's German Shepherds, Kira. Uh, Kira was diagnosed with Lyme disease. And uh, there is my daughter, Elizabeth, and I'll talk about her quite a bit today. Uh, this is her horse, Irie, and Irie was diagnosed with Lyme disease. And uh, ultimately, Elizabeth was diagnosed with Lyme, and it's not a surprise that she was diagnosed because her animals had it, and she's been where they've been. Uh, so I've, I've learned a lot about Lyme personally and with my patients. So here's a, a brief outline of what I will talk about today. Uh, what is Lyme? Brain problems with Lyme. Uh, we'll talk about the kind of brain imaging we do at Amen Clinic, special brain imaging. And then I'll talk about what kind of um, images, brain images, we see with Lyme, and then I'll discuss some cases. So I hope to uh, maybe talk about 40 minutes and leave some time for questions. Okay, here we go. What do we mean by Lyme? Uh, Lyme uh, is an illness, an infection. It's caused by being uh, bitten by a deer tick. The name of the organism is called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, ticks, uh, these deer ticks, uh, we say they're nature's dirty needles. Uh, they've been called cesspools of disease, and they carry many other organisms uh, apart from Lyme. Um, so here are some of the organisms. Borrelia, that's Lyme. But when somebody has Lyme, usually they have Borrelia, and they have uh, one or more of these other things. Bartonella, which is very common, and may actually be more common than Lyme itself, uh, has been called cat scratch fever. Uh, Babesia or Lichia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Mycoplasma, and perhaps a number of viruses, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, herpes viruses, cytomegalovirus. So people often will have a number of different infections, which makes, makes things more difficult for them. Uh, this was a news uh, report from about a year ago. Uh, a body was found in the Alps, uh, frozen in the Alps, uh, kind of in a glacier, and as the glacier melted, this body kind of became apparent. And um, 
the, uh, they've examined this body and they found at least two thirds of the Lyme genome. So this man probably had Lyme, who lived 5,000 years ago in Europe, and they found tattoos over his joints. And one of the thoughts is that um, he was tattooed in these areas because he was having joint difficulty. And uh, the thinking was that maybe the tattoos were a kind of a magical intervention to try to reduce the joint pain that people often have with Lyme. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Lyme uh, tick, the, the deer tick. And I don't know if you can see it so well, but you don't need to see it. Pretty small. Uh, tick bites. You get Lyme and these other organisms by being bitten by a deer tick. And uh, we talk about a bullseye rash that you can see, uh, but most people who are bitten do not see the bullseye rash. Um, one study showed that only 17 recalled a, a tick bite and only 36% recalled a, a rash. Uh, if you notice the tick bite or notice your bullseye rash immediately and you get treatment, you probably can be cured or maybe you can be cured. If you're not treated immediately, uh, you will often go on to develop a chronic Lyme disease. Lyme is widespread. It was I discovered, I put quotes around discovered, it's probably been around for a while, but really defined in Lyme, Connecticut, which is where the name came from. Uh, Lyme disease is epidemic up and down the East Coast and throughout the rest of the United States and in Canada and, and also in Europe and Asia. It's often not recognized. Lyme testing can be problematic and difficult. The, the typical test that one would do at LabCorp or Quest often do not um, pick up the disease. They have a high false negative rate, meaning if you get a negative result, you often don't, you know, you don't know if you can believe it. The most respected lab for Lyme disease is Igenix, which is in Palo Alto, California, but even their testing is not perfect. And in addition to testing for Lyme, you need to test for the co-infections of Lyme that I've mentioned. And Lyme is, in the end, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis made by an expert in Lyme. Uh, they factor in the results of the blood test, but the blood test can only tell us uh, so much. And if you need to see somebody for Lyme, you want to see a Lyme literate physician, somebody who deals with Lyme day in and day out, and not, not somebody who opened up a Merck manual and, and tried to figure out how to treat it. Um, and here I have be suspicious of Lyme. This is what makes us think about Lyme. Uh, cognitive changes, memory loss, uh, fatigue, flu-like illnesses, uh, headache. Uh, if somebody comes in and says that they have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, joint pain, muscle pain, other aches and pains, a history of mono, my own daughter had mono and, and probably never really recovered from that fully. Uh, sleep changes, insomnia is very common and difficult to treat in, in these uh, tick-borne uh, diseases. Uh, MS, there's a thought that MS is related to, um, to Lyme disease, uh, irritability, explosive rages, depression, sudden mood swings. So that covers an awful lot of ground. But especially if they have a, you know, if they were going along okay and then they have a sudden change and, and they have these issues, you think about Lyme. And children, similar things, but a little different because they're kids, behavioral changes, fatigue, school phobias, uh, learning difficulties, and again, headaches, GI complaints, pains, a hypersensitivity to sound, to odors, to touch. Um, when I was in uh, medical school, even before that, they used to say that to know syphilis uh, was to know all of medicine. Syphilis is a venereal disease, of course, and the, the, the shape of the syphilis organism is a corkscrew, which is very similar to the shape of the Lyme organism. So now we say to know Lyme is to know all medicine, and that's because Lyme can mimic or cause any kind of psychiatric, neurological, or um, medical issues. Uh, talk a little bit about the common brain issues with Lyme, attention, executive function problems, attention, focus, concentration, uh, judgment, impulse control, auditory and mental tracking and scanning, memory, language. Uh, I, a little bit later on, I will talk about a patient who had severe uh, language uh, impairment. Uh, spatial processing, visual processing, getting lost, abstract reasoning, slowed processing. Uh, people don't feel as sharp, and in fact, they're not as sharp as they were before. If you don't get Lyme treated uh, well early on, uh, these are some of the possible out outcomes, progressive dementia, seizures, strokes. Uh, there's some thinking that ALS uh, is related to uh, chronic Lyme, Guillain-Barre, MS, Parkinson's, and other, other issues. I wanted to mention something about Erlen syndrome. Erlen syndrome is a very common and little-known uh, visual processing issue. 
We see it a lot in people with autism, ADD, and, and uh, traumatic brain injury. But I have found it a lot in Lyme disease as well. And the hallmark symptoms are uh, extreme light sensitivity, especially sensitivity to fluorescent lights, um, depth perception issues, headaches. Headaches can be severe. Uh, reading issues, words will uh, run together on the page. And as I say, I've often seen this with Lyme. If you think anybody, anybody you know or you have Erlen syndrome, go to the website, www.erlen.com, I-R-L-E-N.com, and, and uh, they have a self-test there and information about Erlen syndrome. Okay, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about uh, SPECT imaging, which is what we do at Emming Clinic. Uh, SPECT imaging stands for Single Photon Emission Computed uh, Tomography. It's a way of looking at brain activity through measurements of blood flow. And we've been doing it for more than uh, 20 years and 80,000 studies. SPECT is easy to understand. This is a picture of one of our SPECT machines. Uh, SPECT looks at areas of the brain that work well, don't work well enough, and, and um, you know, work too hard. This is, uh, this is a normal, and because of the lights, uh, it's a little bit uh, not quite as dark and as well-defined as I would like. But uh, these are views of the surface images of uh, a healthy brain. This is the underside view of the brain as if you were standing in somebody's neck looking up. This is the front of the brain. This is the back. Uh, this is the uh, temporal lobe. This is the right temporal lobe, left temporal lobe. This is the top-down view. You're standing above looking down on the brain. This is the right side view of the brain. This is the back of the brain, the uh, cerebellum, right temporal lobe, uh, prefrontal cortex. And this is the left side view of the brain. And this is one representation of the activity inside the brain. We look at uh, activity in what we call the limbic system, which is the deep emotional regulatory area of the brain. Just, I'm gonna run through a couple uh, examples of what unhealthy brains look like. This is what a brain looks like in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease. This is the underside view of the brain. And what you're seeing uh, represented in the picture are areas of low function. This is the prefrontal cortex. These are the temporal lobes. This is a very unhealthy brain. Uh, these are uh, examples of head injury. Uh, we have done a study of retired NFL football players and their brains look horrible, not surprisingly. Uh, on the left here, severe alcohol abuse, heroin abuse, drugs are very bad for the brain. Uh, these are the reasons for which we uh, do brain scans, brain trauma, cognitive decline, et cetera, violence, toxicity. Uh, it can be helpful in subtyping ADD, uh, looking at mood disorders, refractory or resistant conditions, uh, and including uh, neuropsychiat neuropsychiatric Lyme, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, what SPEC does? SPEC does not give us answers. Uh, it's not magic, but it helps us know what questions to ask. And here's a picture. How do you know unless you look? And I'm not sure you can see that, but uh, I guess you can with the chuckle. It takes, takes a little uh, few moments to figure out what's going on in that. So, I, uh, When I give lectures, I never know whether I should put in that slide, but it often gets laughs, so, so I do. A little bit risque. Okay. Yeah, we, maybe we should dwell on it a little more. I don't know. <laughs> so what we see with Lyme uh, when we do spec scans, uh, some Lyme cases have a normal-looking brain, but about 70% will have um, global hyper, hope, hypoperfusion. Global meaning widespread, hypo meaning low, perfusion means blood flow. So low blood flow, uh, low brain activity. Uh, we talk about a scalloped appearance. The surface of the brain looks bumpy, and I'll show some examples a little bit uh, later. The patterns are not specific for Lyme because in some of these uh, examples, I'll, in some of the Lyme cases, you don't know if it's Lyme or, or something else like toxicity, drug use. Uh, and I have also found that the SPECT imaging is useful to monitor the extent of the inflammation that we see with Lyme, and, and you see a lot of inflammation with Lyme. Okay, uh, typical SPECT uh, Lyme pattern, different from what you would see with depression, Alzheimer's, et cetera, so it, it, it is different. Well, I'm gonna talk about my daughter here, and then we'll talk about uh, some other cases uh, as well. Uh, my daughter Elizabeth is 25, Actually, she was 25 when we did the scan, the first scan, so now she's 26. And she's been treated uh, for Lyme and for some co-infections by Dr. Sam Shore, a, a great doc in Reston who, do, who treats Lyme. She's been treated uh, by him for about three years. 
And in retrospect, looking back, she probably had the uh, Lyme infection for about uh, 12, 13 years before we realized what she had. She was always uh, very physically active with her animals, has a horse, uh, two dogs, a rabbit, turtle, other, other animals. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, her dog, one of her dogs was infected, her horse was infected. And she had severe mono at about 12 or 13. And, and looking back, I think that she never really recovered, never fully recovered from that. And my thinking is that she probably had been exposed to Lyme in one capacity or another. And when she got very severe mono, which lowers your immunity, I, I think the Lyme bugs uh, decided they would, uh, that was their time to uh, take over. And, and she had, uh, she had a, she's had a lot of weakness over the years, fatigue, headaches, mood issues, irritability. She herself has Erlen syndrome, and getting her treated for Erlen uh, has been very helpful. Um, this is a picture, this is a view of the surface uh, of her brain. Again, underside view, top down view. She doesn't have much scalloping. She's got some areas of lower activity right here, kind of the back of the frontal cortex, beginning, beginning of the uh, parietal lobe. And uh, that probably came from uh, f uh, getting thrown off a horse. She was asked to ride a friend's horse one day, and she was thrown off. And even though she was wearing a helmet, she hit a, hit a fence. So she got dinged in her brain. But um, and I, I wish uh, we didn't have the lights, and we need the lights for the, the video, of course. But uh, this is a view of the, uh, the activity deep in the emotional areas of the brain. This is the underside view of the brain. And, here is what we would call the limbic system, and this is before she started treatment for Lyme. So she has a little bit of overactivity uh, there. That's the left basal ganglia. And so what we want to uh, pay attention to is the activity there in this region, the red and the white. Blue is a lower level of brain activity. Red is higher activity than blue, and white is the uh, highest level of brain activity. So this is before she started treatment for Lyme. Let's see here if I can advance it. And this is after she started treatment. So what we're seeing now, tremendously increased activity in the deep emotional regulatory areas of the brain. And what was going on when we scanned her brain at this point was she was having Herxheimer reactions. Herxheimer reactions are inflammatory reactions that you can get when you're treated for Lyme. Uh, usually Lyme treatment involves antibiotics, but it can include uh, supplements and other uh, interventions. But what happens is the Lyme organisms are killed, and they split, and they release toxins, and you feel worse before you feel better. And so this is an example. Uh, here is her limbic system. Her limbic system is on fire, uh, just incredibly overactive, and that's an inflammatory response. And when, uh, when she had this, she was uh, incredibly moody, incredibly irritable. We, uh, this is, uh, we made some interventions that I'll tell you about in a moment. So, so if I can go back here. So this is September 2010. This is a little over a year later. And the limbic system, although still overactive, is much calmer than it was in the previous slide. So the, this is an example of how the scans can be used to monitor the inflammation in the brain, the Herxheimer reactions, and so forth. So how did uh, SPECT help my daughter? Uh, it underscored the need to reduce inflammation. Uh, we were able to visualize that she had tremendous inflammation underscore the need to reduce limbic hyperactivity. The limbic system uh, is the system that comprises the deep emotional regulatory areas of the brain. These correlate with moodiness, irritability. And seeing these pictures helped Elizabeth and her parents, myself and my wife, who's here. Uh, it helped us understand and accept just how much she was struggling with these issues because she could get cranky and, and irritable. And what my wife and I have done is, uh, when she's had difficult times, is we imagine how overactive her brain can be when she's having some of these uh, tough times. So it helps us understand that this is not something that she's choosing. Uh, SPECT helped uh, her daughter, or her daughter, her doctor put her on Lamictal. Lamictal is a mood stabilizer used for seizures, used for bipolar disorders, but it's also used off-label to cool down overactivity in the brain. And the Lamictal was quite helpful uh, for her. Uh, helped really reduce the issues she was uh, wrestling with. And the, uh, the lower amount of inflammation here, um, I, I think, is attributable in large part to the lamictal that she was taking. And she did other, we did other things, too, to reduce her inflammation. So SPEC can help get a sense where you are in the treatment. So uh, outcome, um, finally, after three pretty tough years, she's really getting a lot better. 
Uh, the helpful interventions for her, she's done a lot of things, but IV antibiotics have helped, intravenous antibiotics. Very high dose of vitamin C infusions have helped her tolerate the uh, IV antibiotics. And hyperbaric oxygen treatment has really helped a lot. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment is a treatment in which they put you into a large sealed container, they pump in high pressure oxygen, and the, the oxygen supersaturates your blood and goes uh, obviously into your bloodstream, uh, into your brain. And the hyperbaric oxygen really helps brains reduce inflammation and helps brains heal, and uh, it's been very helpful for her. And we're going to hear a lot about HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen, in the future for many, many different conditions. Uh, this is a different case I've called MB, a female in her mid-40s. Uh, her most striking symptom uh, was uh, a virtual uh, inability to speak. Um, she had uh, Lyme and a number of other uh, brain co-infections, Babesia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, et cetera. Um, and she had also had some heavy metal toxicity. Um, we often will assess for heavy metal um, toxicity by doing hair tests, and there are some other tests you can do. Uh, heavy metal toxicity is fairly common in Lyme disease and other conditions as well. And you can do chelation and other interventions uh, to get rid of the heavy metals. She had uh, traumatic brain injury, that is, uh, hit her head or got hit in the head, significant uh, injuries. And she had uh, many other neurological signs and, and symptoms and, and chronic pain. And her thinking was not, uh, not sharp. Um, she had been treated by Dr. Burriscano, who's one of the, maybe the, the guru of Lyme, one of the most well-respected Lyme doctors uh, around. As I mentioned, she was severely uh, speech impaired. She had run a, a scientific research uh, foundation. Uh, so, and, and she was, uh, before she got sick with Lyme, she was very sharp, just very sharp. And uh, she was artistic, interested in film. She had some HBOT that helped her. But when she first came to see me, she could barely speak. It, it just the, the articulation, searching for words, putting two words together, very difficult, excruciating for her, and painful because I knew how much she had lost. I do have pictures. So this is, this is a scan of her brain at rest where she was sitting calmly. And what we see here, the most important things are she has these big holes in her prefrontal cortex. And when I say holes, she didn't literally have holes in the brain, but the activity level in, in those areas of the brain uh, was so low. And her left temporal lobe here was uh, really not working very well. The left temporal lobe uh, has a lot to do with language processing and, and speech. Uh, the other, the, the top-down view of her brain, not so healthy uh, either. So it was very clear why she was having difficulty uh, with these things. Uh, concentration scan, same date, a little bit better. So uh, I treated her, and I'll, I'll, on a, the next slide or two, I'll talk about what I did, but this is a follow-up scan. And if you look in this, the front of the brain, look in the temporal lobe, they're better. They're not perfect, but they're a lot better than they were. And the follow-up, we call it respect, uh, scan somebody again, or a follow-up scan. So her scans were quite improved, and this, this correlated with the clinical improvement. That is how she felt, how she functioned. Um, the, um, and the improvement, I believe, was tar due to targeting the very low prefrontal cortex. I gave her a stimulant medication, Vyvanse, which we use for ADD. And her speech was dramatically improved. Her cognition, her memory uh, were dramatically improved. And she was receiving other treatments around that time as well. But uh, giving her a stimulant, which I, was, uh, I would felt comfortable doing because I could see that part of the brain malfunctioning on the spec scan, um, it, it was enormously helpful uh, for her. Uh, this is another case, 16-year-old female. Um, she presented with a depression, irritability, anxiety, believed people were watching her. She had cut herself, had been suicidal, uh, saw shadows. And I put down here, review of systems, every, everything. Review of system means when a doctor will ask you, uh, do, you, know, how, you know, how's your thinking, how's your memory, how's your heart, how's your breathing, how's your bladder, how's your joints, et cetera. You kind of, the doctor runs through systematically um, the different areas that, that we check in health. And when I put down everything, she had significant issues or complaints in every area. She had been put on a, a gluten-free diet in the past and had been helpful. Um, I did some Lyme testing by a blood test, and it was positive. And in addition to Lyme, she was diagnosed by Dr. Richie Shoemaker, who's a, a leading expert in uh, mold toxicity, mold conditions. She was uh, diagnosed with mold issues. 
and she had treatment for mold issues and, and it was still struggling. Let's see here. So this is, and I don't know that you're going to be able to see it, but the, the key issue here is what we call the scalloping. There's a bumpiness on the surface of the brain. So it, um, on our computers and on our printouts of the scan pictures, it, it's much more visible. So, um, of course, we did, you know, we did the scans first before I had all of this other information, and the toxic appearance, the scalloped appearance, made me think, what is going on with this brain? Why is this brain so healthy? So this is an example of how the SPECT images make us ask questions. So I, I put down here in the bottom, was that lime? Was it mold? Was it food sensitivity? All of these things can account for a, a toxic scalloped appearance. So we need to check those things. Heavy metal toxicity could also account for that. Uh, this is another case, a 44-year-old woman uh, who had a long-standing interest in alternative healing. I think if she lived here, she'd be at this uh, conference this weekend. Uh, before she got sick with Lyme, she had ADD issues and tended to be impulsive and anxious, but, but she functioned. Uh, she had tick bites. She noted some tick bites in early 2010 and within a few short months, she had five psychiatric hospitalizations, several against her will. And it's important to know that before getting bitten by these ticks, she had no hospitalizations. <coughs> Excuse me. When she saw me, she was catatonic, meaning that she held a kind of a stiff posture, didn't move, didn't respond, had stopped eating, stopped drinking, stopped bathing, was hearing voices, seemed to be lost in conversations, was incoherent, had bizarre thoughts. Uh, really uh, psychotic, this is, you know, this is somebody who would say, well, maybe she's having a schizophrenic uh, break, but usually schizophrenia shows itself before uh, the 40s. So uh, this is her scan, and um, she, again, you may not be able to see it so well, her, she had low functioning on the, in the occipital lobe because of some trauma. Her prefrontal cortex was low, temporal lobes are, are low, um, and this is the, the view of her limbic system here. And uh, this area here is called the anterior cingulate, which we call the brain's gear shifter. When you have too much activity in your anterior cingulate, you tend to get stuck on things. Some people can get stuck in terms of having OCD. Other people can get stuck in terms of getting stuck on negative thoughts, depressive thoughts. So she had that. She had a number of things that were quite out of balance with her brain. Uh, and I just talk about these different areas. She had uh, lots of anterior cingulate uh, gyrus activity, getting stuck on thoughts. Uh, low prefrontal cortex means her judgment not so good. A temporal lobe dysfunction affected mood and anxiety stability. But her brain wasn't looking healthy, and she had this acute change. This is somebody who had not been psychotic before the age of 40-something, and then all of a sudden, after the tick bite, she got psychotic. So could that be Lyme, we wondered. Uh, because she was so disturbed, initially she refused to uh, cooperate and was hospitalized psychiatrically yet again against her will. And in the hospital, she was started on antipsychotics and gabapentin. To, to, uh, gabapentin is a calming agent, and, and she was better. And uh, finally, she consented to do a Lyme test, and uh, it came back positive, and I urged that she get treatment with Lyme. She was somebody who had some different interests and wanted to do, like, energy therapy and so forth, and I'm not putting that down necessarily, but uh, it probably wasn't the, the appropriate treatment for her here. And uh, so she regressed, uh, she stopped her antipsychotics, she, uh, and, and she got more psychotic. So we then restarted her on antipsychotic medication, and ultimately when she got appropriate treatment for Lyme, uh, the psychosis went away and we were able to uh, stop the antipsychotics. So here's, here's a case of where somebody who seems schizophrenic really had Lyme disease, and the apparent schizophrenia remitted. Uh, this is a 22-year-old male, uh, depression, anxiety, anger outbursts, social anxiety, no confidence, and he was self-medicating with marijuana. Um, his anxiety was so bad that father would, would procure the marijuana for him and, and kind of dole it out. And he had a reverse sleep-wake cycle. He would uh, sleep during the day, stay awake all night, roam the house, and disturb his uh, parents. Um, this is the, uh, his surface view here, um, and again, I don't know how much you're going to be able to see, but he has a tremendous amount of scalloping here, just tremendous. The brain looks toxic, so when you know what uh, normal healthy scans look like, you look at this and you say, what's wrong with this brain? So again, one of the things in my differential was Lyme disease. Um, I recommended that he have Lyme testing, 
And for some reason, he, he and his parents would not get testing. I mean, they're very nice people, and they like me a lot, but they wouldn't get it, and they wanted to try other things, and we tried some treatment for anxiety and so forth for sleep. He just didn't uh, improve. He just didn't improve. Finally, I pushed, and I pushed. I said, you have to get testing. So they got the garden variety testing at LabCorp and Quest, which was negative. Uh, and they said, see, he doesn't have Lyme. And I said, uh, not good enough. And uh, so I pushed for the Lyme Igenix testing, which he got, finally, and it was positive. So he's now seeing a Lyme expert and receiving treatment, and he's improved markedly. Uh, he was on Concerta, which boosts the front of the brain, Luvox for depression and, and OCD. And really, uh, he's now going to school. His mood is better, sleeping better, taking classes. This is a guy who is absolutely non-functional. And uh, even though the, the family was reluctant at first to, to get testing for Lyme, they, you know, they can't thank me enough because it has made all the difference in the world. Uh, how did SPECT help in this case? He didn't respond to treatment, which seemed to be reasonable treatment, the kind of things that one normally does for anxiety and depression and sleep and so forth. We tried the typical things. We tried the reasonable things, and they didn't help. And I kept thinking that we were missing something. I kept in my mind that his brain was so scalloped, looked so toxic. So that gave me confidence that the reasonable things for treatment weren't helping. We needed to look for something else, some other explanation. So that's why I pushed for Lyme testing. Let me see what time we have. I think I may skip this case and go on to the next one. Uh, let's see. This is a male in his 50s, uh, lives in a different state. Chronic fatigue, brain fog, memory issues, mind always going, couldn't sleep. This guy was a runner. And even though he wasn't doing well, he would run, run through the mountains like seven miles a day. Uh, very lean, looked very fit. Uh, I was jealous. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, he had had a history of anxiety and depression in the past, but it had long since gone before he came to see me. Uh, he had hepatitis in 1989, and even in spite of being sick, rather sick with hepatitis, and this was long before I knew him, he still ran seven miles a day ran seven miles literally the day he was diagnosed with hepatitis. And he had some hi history of heavy metal toxicity. Um, this was his first scan. And again, um, what we see here, his prefrontal cortex was really very low. The right temporal lobe was very low, some bumpiness, scalloping here. Uh, really not, uh, not all that healthy looking. So I said, the recommendations here, you've got to get tested for Lyme, and I wanted him to be tested for food sensitivity. Suggested he take fish oil and some brain-boosting supplements, and that he try Lamictal or Neurontin to calm down his brain, Vyvanse to boost the front. So he did the test, and he was positive for Lyme, and the food testing showed he was sensitive to dairy products and that he would benefit from a, a dairy-free diet. So I gave him these recommendations, um, and I recommended that he see a Lyme literate physician, eliminate dairy, and I gave him Neurontin, which is gabapentin, help him sleep, and uh, didn't have contact with him for a year. So in a year, he calls me, says he's not doing well, what should he do? And I said, well, why don't you come back and let's scan your brain? And uh, he had really hadn't followed my recommendations, and a year later, he was the same to worse. His memory was worse, and now he had, you know, more fatigue, brain fog, multiple aches. Still running, still running. This guy's like the Energizer Bunny, you know. Um, so this is his, the follow-up scan a year after the first one, and it's really worse. The prefrontal cortex is worse. Now both temporal lobes are affected. Now he's got more scalloping. Uh, brain is looking less healthy. So... I said, uh, you know, your brain is getting worse. You really need to get aggress aggressive and treat your Lyme. He hadn't been treating himself, getting treated for Lyme. Test himself for heavy metals. I recommended chlorella, which is an herb. Uh, it's a chlorophyll derivative. You can take for uh, toxicity. Minimize dairy. And I wanted to give him uh, a stimulant, Vyvanse, to boost the front of the brain. Um, so he did see, uh, this is LLMD, Lyme literate medical doctor. He did see a Lyme doctor, and he started with treatment. And uh, with the Vyvanse that is a stimulant to boost the front of the brain, he felt that he was much more lucid, that, that his kind of the running around in his brain was slowing down. And uh, so I said, in this case, I think the lack of improvement on spec, if not worsening, really he had worsening, combined with the worsening of complaints, resulted in his being able to accept treatment. A bright guy, a very bright guy, but in a way... Um, Maybe a bit stubborn, which, which can, be a, can be a good quality, uh, but sometimes it can get in the way. So uh, he was, he's doing better. 
let's see here. This is, uh, I think I'll talk about one or two other cases and then, then we'll stop and see if we have uh, questions. A uh, woman, history of Lyme, she was treated with uh, a supplement approach, anger, cognitive changes, mood instability. She uh, probably had ADD before she had Lyme, had an eating disorder, hypersensitive to smells and light, likely had Erlen syndrome. Anger and irritability were both uh, significant. She had hypothyroidism and, and uh, she was gluten sensitive. These are all the factors we take into account. We just don't treat for Lyme. You know, we want to look at the whole person. Um, and here are her scans and uh, her prefrontal cortex, uh, not in great shape. The temporal lobes don't look too bad, but the left temporal lobe uh, is affected somewhat. The left temporal lobe, when you have dysfunction there, often results in irritability and anger, even rage. This is her uh, view of her limbic system, you know, thalamic overactivity, which often correlates with uh, mood issues. So what did I recommend? Fish oil, brain-boosting supplements, optimize her response to uh, armor. She was taking armor thyroid, which is a, a, a more natural uh, thyroid uh, supplement. Not a supplement, it's a medication, but uh, more natural than, say, Synthroid. Uh, if your thyroid is not right, a lot of things will be wrong uh, with your health, with your brain. Lamictal to reduce anger, irritability, and vivance. And she had remarkable improvement in irritability, anger, rages. Her energy was better, focused better. So uh, really helped. So I think, uh, let's see here. I'll just talk about this case briefly, and I think uh, then we'll stop. This is an interesting 11-year-old boy who seemed to be normal before he was bitten by a tick. And very soon thereafter, he developed a severe OCD. Um, fear of germs, hand washing, uh, wiping excessively, fear of food, fear of being poisoned. He also had a prominent posterior cerebellar notch. So this is his brain. And uh, this is where the cerebellum is. And it's possible he also has a cyst there uh, of some kind. And this is the view of the, the limbic system. And his brain is on fire. There's a tremendous amount of red there, which you probably can't see. But his brain is on fire. And his anterior cingulate is extremely overactive. So the anterior cingulate overactivity correlates with getting stuck and he got stuck on contamination. So very interesting to think about that. OCD could uh, result uh, from uh, getting an infection, and in fact, that is the case. Uh, so I, um, I, I gave him some recommendations, which I, I won't uh, talk about, and uh, he, he has not followed up with me, unfortunately, so I don't know what the outcome is. But uh, I think if he gets, it does uh, a lot of the things I recommended, he will do well. And I will, I will uh, just jump ahead a couple more cases. So how can SPECT help? We can demonstrate dif diffuse central nervous system involvement. We can, uh, it can help us differentiate Lyme disease from other syndromes. Uh, makes the doctor ask questions about toxicity, about infection, and helps monitor the course of treatment, as we saw with my daughter and some other patients. Patients accept their conditions when they have the SPECT scans. There's less guilt and shame. Often they'll say, you mean it wasn't me, it's my brain. Families can be more understanding. Uh, it helps, helps us target specific areas for uh, remediation, for intervention, such as the prefrontal cortex or temporal lobe. Can document the degree of impairment for uh, disability or to fight insurance companies. And indeed, many patients with Lyme do need to fight their insurance companies. Uh, it makes uh, us reassess diagnoses. I have had uh, several patients, uh, two or three at least, whom I thought initially had a bipolar disorder, and upon getting to know them better and doing, you know, doing the spec scans, doing the testing, it became apparent that actually they had Lyme disease. So uh, this is one last slide, actually a second to last slide. Uh, these are uh, geese uh, in a pond outside my office. I took this yesterday, and these are little goslings, four little baby geese, uh, and it's a shame it's not a little clearer or bigger, but they're floating around, swimming around uh, with their parents, so very cute. Anyway, that is the end, uh, the end of what I have to say. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions, if anybody has any. And uh, yeah, if you would walk up here, please. Uh, hi, my name's Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I want to know a little bit more about the SPECT scanning. Mm -hmm. is, it, um, is there any radiation used in it? Is it covered by insurance? Um, how exactly does it work? And I was also curious, I mean, I can tell you, you use some traditional and non-traditional, mm -hmm. which is nice to see. Right. Um, I was uh, curious about what you use to check for food sensitivities. Um, 
Well, food sensitivities, um, I, I am doing that, I'll, I'll deal with that I, in, in a way that's least important question, I guess, or one of, one of the questions of lower importance, but um, I used to check every single patient for food sensitivity, and then the particular lab I was using discontinued that test, which I actually liked. Um, for the most part, when I check for food sensitivity, I've been using metametrics. I'm not overjoyed with the results, but they give some reasonable results. What we're really tending to do now, if we suspect food sensitivity, we suggest that people go on an elimination diet or a gluten-free, dairy-free diet. The, the reality is that nearly the entire U.S. population, with the exception of infants, would do better on gluten-free, dairy-free uh, with those foods, and we could talk about that a little bit later if you are interested, but uh, they can cause tremendous inflammation. Uh, you can do some blood tests for gluten sensitivity, for example, uh, but even if the test says you don't, most people will benefit by going gluten-free. Um, shifting to the, the spec does involve radiation. Uh, we inject a small amount of radiation into somebody's vein. Uh, it goes into the front, you know, from the vein into the brain where it gets fixed. So wherever for, for six hours. So whatever they're doing at the moment of injection, it's like taking a Polaroid snapshot. Uh, insurance will cover sometimes, not not all the time. Mm -hmm. They tend to cover more if if you have what you would cons what they would consider a serious. I put the serious in quotes. Uh, a serious uh, brain issue like temporal lobe trauma, seizures, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, when people come to see us, there are charges for the SPECT imaging if you have that, and then there are sort of more traditional charges for the doctor visits and so forth, and, and the, you know, the insurance will tend to cover that. Um, did I answer your questions? Is or it very more? expensive? I mean, um, the, uh, the full evaluation with the brain imaging is 3575 so it, it's not inexpensive, but... Mm -hmm. um, but often it can help us see things that have not been picked up by any other means. So it, it, even though it's, you know, it, it's a fair chunk of change, uh, it can save money in the long run and, and hopefully reduce suffering. And, Quality of life. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. How much? Uh, this uh, woman here is that the woman? This is my wife. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> The, the amount of radiation, it, it's, it, you know, it's a finite amount of radiation, of course. It's small. It's about one-third the, the amount of radiation you would get if you had a head CT scan. So, it, it, you know, it's slight. I mean, I've been scanned. My daughter's been scanned three times. I've scanned my daughter-in-law. I've scanned my niece. I've scanned my nephew. I've scanned my brother-in-law. Dr. Amons, uh, Daniel Amons, has been scanned 11 times. So, I, I just said we, we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. If we didn't think it was, you know, a, a rather safe, uh, we wouldn't do it. Go ahead, please. Oh, two questions, please. Yeah. Um, back to your slide where it said it's prevalent on the East Coast. Yes. Um, two questions. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm quite scared now because I was working with a commander at the Coast Guard um, five years ago who was an avid runner, like your yes. example, um, went and lives in Loudoun County, went hiking one weekend. Uh, matter of fact, ran in the office running in her shorts. Yeah, yeah. Um, went hiking. By Monday, she was debilitated uh, in intensive care, had been diagnosed with, well, she'd gotten bit by a tick, diagnosed with Lyme disease, and currently uh, unable to speak, walk, or anything. It took her almost two years just to be able to walk with wow. her walker. Wow. Okay, that brings me to my two questions because I'm quite scared. We have a ranch in California. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, well, one horse just died, five horses, um, chickens, peacocks, two dogs and mm -hmm. the whole bit. Um, we have eight children ages 11 to 17 that are on the ranch all the time. Mm. Well, all those symptoms that you described, they keep getting sick. Mm -hmm. um, we've lost most of my family to cancer and Dave, the one of 20 years just passed away, of, which my brother-in-law says of cancer. After listening to your um, your speech and your slides. Right. How prevalent is this in California in the areas where there's a lot of livestock and, uh, and ranches where, where they live? And second question, how can I get them to be tested or change the diet or know that maybe some of these symptoms that they're experiencing a lot, or mm -hmm. maybe they might should get tested without being offensive? Well, it, it's... It's rather prevalent in California. It's probably less prevalent because of the arid areas where they, they may not have as much foliage and, and fewer deer, but 
Uh, they used to, people used to say up until a couple years ago, there's no Lyme in California, but, but it is clear that, that there's quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. um, More southern than northern, or northern or southern? Um, I, you know, I don't have a clear sense. I think throughout the state, I, I know of um, one individual, in, well, several in southern California who've had it. You know, the other thing is people travel, uh, and so we, we don't just stay rooted in one area. But, it, you know, assuming that they're there most of the time, it is there. Um, how do they, you know, how would you recommend they get tested? I mean, you could um, get a pamphlet. Uh, there, an organization that's good is called ILADS, I-L-A-D-S, which is an organization I belong to, International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. You could go to their webpage. They have a lot of good information there. There's, there's a booth, or not a booth, a table uh, in the exhibit room that, from the Lyme Disease Association. I didn't get a chance to talk to whomever is manning the table. He or she uh, weren't there. But they have some good brochures you could send along. Or you could recommend, or, or I guess rather than saying would you get testing, see if they get testing by somebody who doesn't have a good sense of what Lyme is, uh, it's probably going to be negative. They're going to be told they don't have Lyme, and that, then that makes it worse. So um, if they were interested in seeing somebody, they would want to find a Lyme literate clinician, a Lyme literate doctor. And if they don't have any other, you know, other way to find that out, uh, if they can't just Google it, if you go to that ILADS website, uh, there's a, uh, you could contact the director, Barbara Buckman, and, and she can let you know uh, that who might be near them, but okay. the, the key is to be seen somebody by somebody who has a good sense of what Lyme is. I think because it, it hasn't been talked about a lot, mm -hmm. and they're going to say to me, oh, you always go to those health things, you always come home with another thing, but, um, you know, the bipolarism yeah. and all of that is really very scary, so thank you very You're much. You're welcome. I, I hope they listen to you. question about those areas of inactivity in the SPECT. Yes. Um, after you're treated for the Lyme, does your brain heal? Does the scalloping go away? Or will you see that in subsequent SPECT scans? Uh, often it will go away and the brain will look healthier as you do the follow-up scans. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the question is, if people didn't hear, if you get antibiotics right after the bullseye, are, are you home free, are you cured, uh, so to speak? And this gentleman is saying that he notices some brain fog, you were saying. And, um, maybe, maybe not, I think, is, is the answer. Um, and, and a, you know, usually, uh, if you call up your primary care doctor tomorrow morning and say, you know, I was out hiking, I just saw a bullseye, They'll give you doxycycline, maybe maybe three weeks, maybe a month. Um, that may be sufficient, but it, it's depending on what co-infections that tick had. The doxycycline may not kill those, may not kill Bartonella, for example, or some other things. So you may not be home free. And I think if you have a concern, the the best what the best thing to do is consult a Lyme literate, you know, clinician and, and have them you know, talk with you, maybe do some testing to try to sort it out. I saw something on one of your slides about a, a Cowden protocol. Mm -hmm. That's the second I've heard of at this um, conference. So that's one question. And then another question, um, are you familiar with the Dr. Weitzel uh, protocol over in Germany using an infrared light to treat Lyme and all the various uh, co-infections, and if so, can you comment on that? Uh, you know, the second one, I, I'm not, so I, I can't say uh, I can't say anything about that. I, I am aware of the Cowden Protocol. I, I don't know that much about it. It's a uh, it's an approach that does not involve medication, but nutritional supplements to to um, kill the kill the bacteria and boost the immune system. So, the the one patient I mentioned who had had the Cowden Protocol, and I've had several others uh, who've had it. Uh, she got rather good results from it, so she had not been treated with antibiotics. But I don't think it's appropriate for everybody. Uh, my concern about non-antibiotic treatment is that this, this stuff is really hard to eradicate, and I, my impression is that in many cases antibiotics are indicated, but I, don't, I, I can't say that in every one. Uh, yes. <laughs> 
Hi. Veronica. Um, Hi. How far is the moment in the future when we will be able to get um, vaccination against Lyme, which will probably take away your job? <laughs> well, no, I, I treat much more than Lyme, so I'd be happy to lose that part of it, believe me. Uh, is there any search in that area? There, there is research. Uh, there, uh, there had been efforts toward a vaccination you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and it was aborted. Um, I suspect five, 10 years, um, but uh, that, you, you know, it's like anything else. Um, those of us who are harboring the Lyme organism, you know, the vaccination won't help us because we already have it, but you would give it to younger people, just like, you know, you, you give, it, give the polio vaccine to people who hadn't had it and they're protected, so. Can we treat um, this, this uh, animals somehow or not that they don't give it to us? Well, and, yeah. and also you mentioned a few times a reduced dairy, why so? In, in treatment, yeah? Thank you. Many people, you're welcome, Many people have sensitivity to dairy products. Um, and it's the, uh, the casein, which is a dairy protein. And when you, if you have sensitivity to dairy and you consume it, you develop inflammation in your gut. And when you, you can develop what's called a leaky gut. The, the cells lining the intestine swell. You don't absorb your nutrients as well. The bacterial, uh, bacteria in your gut, and you have uh, 600 or more different species of bacteria in your gut, they get out of balance, yeast may take over, cl uh, clostridia uh, may take over. So uh, then you get generalized infl inflammation. So if, if you eliminate the dairy from your diet, um, you, you sort of minimize that contributor to the inflammation. We call the gut the second brain. The gut has 95% of the serotonin in the body. Yes, please. Hi, I am a colon hydrotherapist, and I have recently had, well, I've had several people with Lyme's come to me, but they, most of them have not continued the process and, mm -hmm. uh, to my recommendations at all. But I've recently had two 19-year-old twin girls who've been through all kinds of things with Lyme disease and basically are still treating co-infections yes. versus Lyme directly. But yes. they've been having doing a consistent series of colonics, colon hydrotherapy mm -hmm. with me, and they are feeling so much better. Mm. They weren't even able to drive. Their mother brought them the first several times. Right. And now they're both, their, their brains are clearing. They're yes. both in college, and so they really need to have their brains working, you know? Uh, indeed. So their brains are clearing. They can now drive themselves to my clinic, and, and they're feeling so much better. They just, they've been doing all kinds of other things, treatments. Sure. And you know, nutritional things yes. and avoiding dairy and gluten and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But they felt that the cleansing has really boosted their body's ability to deal with this. I so don't, I so don't know that much, with you know, about that, although I've had a number of patients uh, who've had it and I know some people who do it. So I imagine you're really helping to rebalance the gut yeah, and exactly. get out the... You're helping that second brain and yeah. help the first brain. That's and right. So. so I just wondered if you knew anything about that, have had any experience with you know, uh, you know I've, as I say, a couple of patients yes. have had it, but I, I, I don't know that and, much about it. It's something I need to learn and more then about. And then with being consistent with yeah. cleansing, um, one of them every two times a week because she has problems going to the bathroom at all. Right. And the other one once a week. She had been doing two times, but she's reduced it to one. Sure. And, and she, they're, they're both really, really happy with, with it. Well, so wonderful. Thank you. When you do that, do you, do you add special probiotics to replenish the I always floor? give the person by mouth, but they, mm -hmm. there's also a, a, a way that I could actually do an implant yeah. if they want yeah. to do that, and some people request it. I was yeah. actually taught to do it, but, but then I was told we weren't supposed to do the implants directly because yeah. uh, the FDA doesn't recognize them. So, so now I always just give a, a capsule of probiotics, but if I have special requests, I go ahead. Have another way? I have another way, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, in light of the similarities of this, the uh, Lyme strain with syphilis, uh -huh. is it your belief that uh, the disease can only be contracted via tick bite? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, there... The disease can clearly be passed from mother to her fetus, to her baby. Uh, there is some, and I put, I'll, I'll put quotes around this some, 
there's some evidence that uh, Lyme could be passed sexually, like, like uh, syphilis. Um, the, the main route of transmission right now is thought to be by, you know, getting bitten by a deer tick. Uh, there's also some evidence that being bitten by you know, mosquitoes. I mean, if a mosquito bites somebody who's been infected and then they go bite somebody else, couldn't they transmit it? I think so, but I, I, I can't quite cite you the, the data to support that. So I'm giving you a lot of maybes, unfortunately, but uh, it, it's a good question. It's a good question. Yes? Hi, I just wanted to thank you, but I wanted to ask, uh, is there any way to prevent it if you know that you're going to be out in the field or you actually have a job out there? Uh, is there something that you can take? Well, you would, you would want thank to, uh, you're welcome, you would want to cover yourself up, wear long pants, tuck your pants in your socks. Um, there, are, there are different repellents you can get. And then, uh, very importantly, when you come in, you know, when you're done being out that day, either working or whatever you were doing, uh, do a very close inspection. In fact, you would want somebody else to check you because obviously you can't see your whole body, and, you know, including your head. The ticks seem to like to crawl up your neck into your hair for some reason. So you need to have somebody check, check your scalp, which you can't see yourself. So uh, those are preventative some steps, not, not foolproof, of course. Yes? Last question. <laughs> um, I got Lyme disease, I guess, six or seven years ago. Uh -huh. And it was a bullseye, and I got treated immediately. Right. But my symptoms were like a severe flu, mm -hmm. um, and I had the chills, and I could not get warm. And I went and I sat outside. It was like 90 degrees outside. I had blankets around me. Yeah. And and um, are those the typical symptoms that you always have every time you're bitten? Are there typical symptoms, or does it change? Thank you. That, you're welcome. That sounds more or less uh, typical, but, but there's a lot of variation. Uh, as I was saying earlier, that you know, Lyme can mimic any kind of you know, medical, neurological, psychiatric issue. So it varies from person to person. Some people, as the illness goes on, you're, you're talking about right when you were bitten, of course, but as the disease goes on, some people will have very severe joint involvement, other people less so. About 70% seem to have uh, significant brain involvement, but not everybody. We don't know why. What you're talking about sounds rather typical. Yes. I guess that's it, huh? Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you.